Clear out the clouds. Clear out the clouds, right? Okay, you're good. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we Welcome to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey uh, here in Hope, New Jersey in Jenny Jump State Park. Uh, we are streaming this live to an online audience as well as an in-person audience. So the weathermen lied to us, um, as the weathermen is wont to do. And uh, it, we did have some brief showers, so that was fun. A little bit of unexpected rain. So uh, our, sorry. Tonight's presentation is an introduction to deep sky observing with Bill Murray and AAAP. And while uh, we have our in-person audience uh, wandering down and setting up their chairs, uh, we're just going to go over a couple things. We are av available online at uacnj.org. Um, that is our website. You can check us out. You can see all our member clubs. Any events we're doing will be posted there, as well as a schedule of all our talks for the year. Um, you can also check us out on our Facebook. We have an Instagram, Twitter. I feel like there's one other one I'm forgetting. <laughs> uh, we do live stream these talks to YouTube, and then uh, they are saved to the our YouTube. So you can always go back and check out past presentations, or you can, if you can't make it out to our on-site location, you can go over to our YouTube and check out any past presentations, or if you want to watch us live, uh, come join us. I am monitoring chat. It'll be nice to have more people in the chat. So it looks like we have a lot of our in-person uh, viewers here. So a couple things for you guys. Uh, if you need to use the bathroom it there is the porta potty uh, right behind you to my right your left we do have a small gift shop and all proceeds of that go to helping us keep our lights on and offering free public program and uh, maintenance uh, and small upgrades like uh, the past couple weeks we've been having a problem since it's daylight when we start our presentations uh, our old projector was not quite strong enough or bright enough to force its way through the daylight. We have since upgraded to a slightly brighter, and by slightly, it's like four times brighter, according to specs or something like that, maybe three times. So, yay. Uh, with that, like I said, our program tonight is an introduction to deep sky observing with Bill Murray from AAAP, which is... Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. Yay, I forget all the time because uh, we have so many acronyms and after a while you're like, which A is that? All uh, right, Bill is an am amateur astronomer for more than 50 years and has been employed as a software engineer in the Electron Optics Division of David Sarnoff Resource Center in Princeton for 18 years. More recently, he has taught in high school mathematics and physics at Trenton Catholic Academy in Hamilton, New Jersey, and is currently employed as a planetarium technician at the New Jersey State Museum Planetarium in Trenton, New Jersey. A longtime or 36 year member of the AAAP, uh, Bill has held posts as observatory chairman, secretary, program chairman, assistant director, and director in the club. And tonight's presentation, an introduction to deep sky observing, is how a short intro on how to observe objects beyond the solar system, nebula, open clusters, gal globular clusters, and planetary nebula will be introduced and their place in the life cycle of stars will be discussed. Observing tips on how to find and how to observe these objects will be reviewed. And with that, here's Bill. Thank you, Kim. Welcome to all of you hardy souls uh, who come out in this uh, rough weather tonight. Uh, unfortunately, tonight we won't be able to get a look at a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about in my lecture, but hopefully the weather will be nice this summer. You'll get a chance to come up and view through some of our telescopes uh, remotely uh, some of the objects we're going to talk about in my speech tonight. So an introduction to deep sky observing. 
So you have a telescope. Congratulations. Uh, you started on one of the most fascinating hobbies that I've ever encountered in my life, uh, and hopefully you will enjoy it as well. Uh, maybe the telescope was a gift. Uh, maybe you decided uh, after reading about astronomy to go out and buy yourself a telescope. But now you have a telescope and the question is, what do you do with it? What do you look at? And pretty much everyone who's ever had a telescope has gone through the same cycle of things to look at, uh, starting with the obvious and moving on to things that are not so obvious. So the first thing is observing the moon. So of course the moon is everybody's first object to look at through a telescope. It's bright, it's easy to see, and easy to find, and it has a lot of detail. The moon is our natural satellite. It's about 250,000, a little bit less, miles away from the Earth. It's the closest astronomical body to us here on the Earth, and the only one that human beings have visited. Uh, about 50 years ago, there were a dozen or so Americans who walked on the surface of the moon. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And uh, hopefully sometime this decade, we will be going back. But that's yet to be determined. But you can actually explore the moon for yourself if you have a telescope. You get to see some of the features on the moon here. Um, this is a picture of the first quarter moon, uh, just about the current phase of the moon, a few days later uh, is what we would have seen the moon in the sky tonight, uh, showing some of the features on the moon. These dark areas are actually called maria. They're large flat lava plains that uh, were caused by huge meteorite impacts on the moon's surface many billions of years ago. Uh, but the moon is best known for its millions of craters. And along the terminator, which is the distinction line between the sunlit side of the moon and the night side of the moon, you can see the most detail and you can see uh, a vast amount of detail on the moon, even with a small amateur telescope. And there are astronomers who start observing the moon and really never get any farther than that because the moon fascinates them so much that they spend their entire career as astronomers just observing the moon. You can do that uh, because the moon is changing from night to night. Uh, even from month to month, it's not the same because the moon vibrates a little bit, vibrates, so it's never quite exactly the same. And so a fascinating object to look at. But if you're like most amateur astronomers with a telescope, after looking at the moon for a while, you say to yourself, okay, what else is there to view up there, okay? Fortunately, we have a solar system with other planets in it. Uh, there are actually eight planets in our solar system. Uh, my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas, was the mnemonic we all learned, at least I did back when I was school, to remember the order of the planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Pluto got kicked out of the major planet club about 15 years ago. It's now classified as a dwarf planet. That's still a topic that incites some controversy in the astronomical, astronomical community. Uh, but many of these planets are fascinating to look at in their own right, and you get to see a lot of detail with small telescopes. There are some problems, however. Uh, and one of the major problems is we live at the bottom of an ocean of air. And that ocean of air acts as um, an optic in front of your telescope. So as you see here, if you're interested in viewing the planets, what you want is stable atmosphere, okay? Uh, if you have stable linear atmosphere here without a lot of turbulence, you get a view of the planets that looks something like that. Very nice, a lot of detail. Uh, if, however, there's a lot of turbulence in the atmosphere, uh, with winds and cross currents and everything, you get a view of the planet that looks a lot more like this. Unfortunately, New Jersey happens to be mostly this. <laughs> uh, very few nights here that you get a very clear, stable atmosphere to view the planets. They do occur, but they're pretty rare. Okay? And so this will interfere a lot with viewing planets and makes it kind of difficult, sign it kind of challenging as well. Okay. This is a picture of Mars in the telescope taken on film about 30 years ago. And about 30 years ago, this was the best you could get from Mars because of that blurring of the atmosphere. 
Usually when you take a picture of a planet on film, you had to take a picture of at least a couple of seconds, and that was enough to blur the image quite a bit. So it was very rare you saw an image that was much sharper than this. But nowadays, technology has advanced to the point where amateur astronomers can image the planets in much more detail than professional astronomers could 50 years ago, mainly because of webcams. So about 30 years ago, uh, somebody decided to take the security cams that are ubiquitous around the world and turn them to astronomy. Uh, they're very sensitive. Uh, they mainly used at night, so they're very sensitive in low light conditions. And the nice thing about them is you can... One sec. Can you turn off the power on that and then use this microphone? Because we noticed the battery's dead on that. Oh. Well, so people are like, we see mouths moving. No one's home. Okay. Uh, I need the Sorry about that, all you people at home. Uh, so, uh, as I said, webcams came in about 30 years ago. And the nice thing about webcams is you can take exposures of anywhere from a 60th to a thousandth of a second with a webcam and still see a lot of detail. And at that very fast exposure, you freeze out a lot of the atmosphere. And then people develop software that if you take a video of a planet, you can take the best images out of that video and stack them up to get a very good image of a planet. So a modern image of Mars looks something more like this. This was actually taken in my observatory. I took it last October. And this is actually the first image of a planet that I ever took. And I was very pleased with it. You can see a lot of detail here. You see the polar cap on Mars, uh, a lot of the high dusty plains, some of the lower lowlands. Uh, not bad for a first image, I thought. Okay, and you can see similar images on the other planets as well. Uh, this is an image of Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is a fascinating object, the largest planet in our solar system. A lot of detail in its clouds. Uh, Jupiter is a gas giant planet. That means there's no solid surface on Jupiter. It's gas all the way down to its core. And it has a system of moons, I believe at last count there were 69 moons orbiting around Jupiter. Uh, the four largest ones are as large as our moon. Jupiter is actually kind of like a miniature solar system in its own right. So from night to night you can you observe Jupiter and see these moons changing positions around the planet. Uh, something that's fascinating to watch. You can watch eclipses of the moons of Jupiter and even uh, the moons passing in front of the planet and casting their shadows on the planet. So Jupiter is a fascinating object to look at. Probably the most fascinating planet, though, is Saturn, the ringed planet. Uh, and this is kind of the view that you would see in an amateur telescope. Uh, if the atmosphere is a little mushy, it looks more like this on a very clear night, something like that. Uh, Saturn is more than a billion miles away. Not quite as much detail in its clouds as Jupiter's, uh, but the ring is fascinating to look at. Okay. So now you've observed the moon, you've observed the planets, so what's next? Okay. So if you're like many amateur astronomers with your telescope, uh, you start observing what are called deep sky objects. These are objects that are outside of our solar system, okay? Uh, and they consist of a variety of different types of objects. There are emission and reflection nebula, open star clusters, planetary nebula, supernova remnants, globular star clusters, and galaxies. We're going to talk a little bit about each of them, show you some examples of things that you can see in amateur-sized telescopes, and uh, then give you a little bit of uh, uh, some tips on how to observe these objects. So first up, okay, what are these objects? They were first discovered about 300 years ago by some of the first astronomers to turn telescopes at the nighttime sky. And it seems to be kind of a theme in science that scientists love to give names to things that they don't really understand. We still do this today. Astronomers talk about dark matter and dark energy without really knowing quite what those things are. And that was still you know, extant 300 years ago when astronomers were looking at the universe for the first time. So they turned their telescopes to the night sky and they saw occasionally these little cloudy patches in their telescope. They didn't know what they were, but they gave them a name. They called them nebulae, which in Latin means 
cloud. And that's because that's what they look like through telescopes. These are some various nebulae. Okay? Astronomers didn't understand what they were then. We have much more knowledge about what these objects are now. Probably the first major astronomer to investigate nebulae, although it wasn't his purpose, was this gentleman here. He was a French astronomer. His name was Charles Messier. Uh, he lived uh, in the 18th century. He was a contemporary of George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. And his main activity uh, observing the night skies from Paris back in the 18th century was discovering comets. And he was very good at it. Uh, he discovered more than 15 comets on his own, uh, was so renowned for as many comet discoveries that he won a medal from the King of France for discovering comets. But as he spent many years observing and trying to find comets from the roof of the observatory in Paris, uh, occasionally he would run across these nebulae. And he became a little irritated about that because they interfered with his comet searches. Uh, comets eventually move through the nighttime sky and disappear. These nebulae were fixed in the nighttime sky and never moved or disappeared. Uh, but they look very similar to comets. And so when Messier was searching the night sky, he would occasionally find one of these nebulae and he'd have to observe it for several days before realizing that it wasn't moving and wasn't a comet. And eventually, uh, he decided to do future comet hunters a favor by s making a list of all these objects that he found uh, so that they wouldn't be fooled by them and publishing that list. Um, he found about 100, a little more than 100 of these objects in his many years of searching. Uh, and the irony is now 250 years later, nobody really remembers any of the comets Messier found. They remember him for this list of 110 nuisance objects, which are now called the Messier objects. Uh, they tend to be some of the brightest and best deep sky objects uh, that you can see in the night sky with small telescopes. And many of the examples that we're going to talk about this evening were objects that were discovered or rediscovered by Charles Messier. Another astronomer who was uh, much more interested in what these objects were and in discovering them was this gentleman who was a contemporary of Messier. His name was William Herschel and he's probably in the entire history of astronomy my favorite astronomer uh, because he has such an interesting backstory. Uh, he was born in Germany and uh, was, his father was uh, uh, in the military and he wanted his son to follow him in the military. He was a uh, musician in the military. Uh, military bands were a big thing back in the 18th century. And uh, so Herschel was kind of predestined to go into the, uh, the German military, uh, which he discovered very rapidly was not the career path that he wanted to follow. So he decamped from the German army and sailed to Britain and um, set up a business teaching music in the city of Bath, uh, which was one of the, uh, the more uh, uh, high class locations in England at that time. And one day when he was giving a music lesson, uh, the, the student he had said, uh, I'm a little short on cash right now, so I can't pay you. Can I pay you in kind? And he gave him a, t a kit for building a telescope. And Herschel said, yeah, OK, I'll take it. And uh, looked it over a little bit later and started to become fascinated with astronomy. So he began his career the way many of us do as amateur astronomers. He was an amateur astronomer. And he became completely fascinated by the, both the uh, activity of building telescopes and using them to observe the nighttime sky. And so he would give his music lessons and then rush home to work on his telescopes. In the evening, he'd take his six telescopes out into his backyard uh, and start observing the nighttime sky. He was really interested in everything that he saw. And so he didn't really care about comets. He wanted to see these nebulae and to discover how many of them he could find. Uh, but his moment of fame came in the year 1781 when he was searching the skies uh, in his backyard to discover these nebulae, and he discovered what he thought was a comet, but it turned out to be a planet. He had discovered the planet Uranus, and he became the first person to antiquity, since antiquity to discover a major planet in the solar system. He was instantly famous throughout the world. And uh, in a, an inspired piece of PR, when uh, people asked him what he wanted to name this planet, he thought about it for a minute, and he called the new planet George's star after King George III of England. 
Uh, King George was impressed with this, um, decided to give Herschel, Herschel a stipend and hire him as his own personal astronomer so he could give up his music career and enter into astronomy, and also gave him funds to start building the largest telescope in the world, a feat which he accomplished three times in his life building bigger and bigger telescopes. Uh, when he finally died at the ripe old age of 84, he was the greatest astronomer in the world, having discovered more things in the nighttime sky than any of the professional astronomers of his time. Okay. I always get inspired by that story. Some of the objects that we'll talk about were discovered by Herschel. Okay. So the question everybody asks when they first look through an amateur-sized telescope is, why don't these things look like the pictures I've seen in magazines? So you see a picture that looks like this of an astronomical object. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. And then you look through a telescope and it kind of looks like that. Okay. Turns out the human eye is very insensitive to color at low light levels. So if you have like a, a magazine with many glossy colored photographs and you're looking at it under bright light, of course you can see all the colors. But then if you take it into a darkened room, Okay, you may still be able to see the pictures, but the colors become very diffuse and unsaturated, and that's because your eye has a lot of trouble picking up color at low light levels. And that same effect also affects trying to observe these type of objects through telescopes. Uh, many of the pictures that you've seen were taken by very sensitive cameras that were exposed for hours and sometimes days to see the detail that you're seeing here. Okay, so what are these objects and how do they all fit together? Okay, in one way or another, they're all related to the life cycle of stars. So stars, like people, are born, live their lives, and die. But how a star lives its life and how long it lives is determined by one fact, and that's how much mass it was born with. So there are these gas clouds uh, called nebulae, uh, stellar nebulae, that exist throughout our uh, Milky Way galaxy, uh, mostly made of hydrogen gas. And in these clouds, occasionally one clump will become a little bit denser by random chance than another clump. And when that happens, it begins to contract. And as it contracts, its gravity increases and it begins to pull in more gas. And as that happens, that area of condensation starts to become hotter and denser. Eventually, it becomes so hot and dense that nuclear reactions start and a star is born. Okay. What happens to that star after that is determined by how much mass it started off with. Stars like our sun, which are relatively small, uh, burn up their hydrogen fuel at a relatively re reasonable rate. They can last for billions of years. Stars that are smaller than our sun, uh, red dwarf stars, can actually last for tens of billions of years. But eventually, they'll use up all of their hydrogen fuel and uh, they'll expand into what's known as a red giant star. And then once that expansion is finished, the remaining gas is blown off into a cloud from the dead core of the star, which is called a white dwarf, into what's known as a planetary nebula. And then eventually the white dwarf cools down and you have a black dwarf. So stars like our sun don't end in a bang, they end in a whimper. Okay. But it's very different if you have a much more massive star. So stars that are about 10 times the size of the sun have a very different life cycle. They burn up their hydrogen fuel very quickly. Uh, many times they last only a few millions or tens of millions of years instead of billions of years. And they end their lives as red supergiants and then a titanic explosion explodes that star and creates a supernova. And supernovas occur occasionally in our galaxy. Uh, a bright supernova can outshine all the other stars in our galaxy for a period of a few weeks to a few months. Okay? What's left over after the supernova is dependent upon how much mass the star had. If a star is about 10 times the mass of the sun, it ends as a neutron star. But if it's much more massive than about 12 or 13 times, it ends as a black hole. It essentially rips itself out of our universe and creates a hole in space. So all of these stages of the life cycle of stars can be viewed through small telescopes. So first up, we have emission nebulae, okay? These are 
clouds of gas, mostly hydrogen, where stars are being born. And they glow because what's happening is as the stars are born in the cloud, the radiation from the star illuminates the gas, and then that gas glows. Okay. So you can see these, what looks like cloudy patches in small telescopes is actually glowing gas around the birth areas of stars. One of the more interesting of these nebula that's going to be visible in the coming months, it's a summer object, is the 17th object on Messier's list, known as the Swan or Omega Nebula, was discovered by the Swiss astronomer de Chasseau in 1764 and by Messier a few weeks later. Messier's description was a train of light without stars, five or six arc minutes in extent, in the shape of a spindle. And it's called the Swan Nebula because it kind of has the resemblance to the profile of a swan. There's the swan's head, and there's his body, and this is actually the way it looks in amateur-sized telescopes. Okay. There are several other of these objects that are visible throughout the year. Another one that's uh, very interesting in the summer sky is M8, the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius, and this is NGC 2237, one of Herschel's discoveries. Uh, that's in the constellation of Monoceros in the winter sky. And probably the brightest and most detailed emission nebula that you can see here in the northern hemisphere is this object, M42, the Great Nebula in Orion. So the next type of objects we want to talk about are open clusters. So in the life cycle of stars, these are very young stars. So in these gas clouds where stars are being born, eventually the radiation from all of these young stars uh, dissipates the remaining gas and ends the cycle of star birth. And what you're left with is a grouping together of between several dozen and several hundred very young stars. Okay, And so all of these stars are were born in the same family. Uh, they're very young. Uh, only a few tens of thousands to tens of million years old. That sounds old to us, but stars um, that can, as I said, can live for billions of years. So a star that's only a million years old is in even out of the celestial maternity ward yet. Okay. So this object is will be rising uh, or in September. It's in the fall sky. It's called NGC 869 and 884, known as the double cluster. Uh, it's visible to the unaided eye if you have dark enough skies and know where to look. And the, the American astronomer uh, William Tyler Olcott called the field is simply stone with scintillating stars and the contrasting colors are very beautiful. Stars do have different colors because they have different temperatures. And uh, where st stars are individual that you see in the nighttime sky with your unaided eye, it's kind of difficult to pick out star colors because the colors aren't very saturated. Uh, but if you can see the stars right next to each other, as if they're in a cluster, uh, it becomes much easier to pick out star colors. So you can see here there's a lot of different color stars, oranges, reds, blues, and whites. Okay. And they're all visible in the double cluster. This is a view of what the double cluster looks like in a telescope uh, at a low power view, which is a low magnification view. You can actually fit both of these clusters into the same field of view in the telescope and see them both. Uh, open clusters tend to be some of the best objects to observe uh, with small telescopes uh, because they're not really affected by light pollution. Uh, emission nebula tend to get washed out by the light of the moon, and also we happen to live in New Jersey, which is not the greatest place in the world to do astronomy, uh, but we all live here, so we just have to deal with what we have. Um, but open clusters, the individual stars aren't eliminated by light pollution, so you can see them just as well from a lit area like New Jersey as you can from a dark area out west. Some interesting open clusters are here, M45, the Pleiades, uh, in the winter sky, M37 and M35 in Auriga and Gemini, also in the winter sky. But there are many other interesting uh, open clusters in the summer sky as well. Then we have planetary nebula, which is what's going to happen to our sun in uh, about four billion years. So as I said, uh, this is the remains of sun-like stars. So when a star like our sun 
after several billion years of burning its hydrogen fuel, uses up that fuel, it becomes unstable and begins to pulsate and grow in size until it becomes a giant star. And then eventually um, that instability throws off most of the remaining gas in the star into an expanding cloud that's illuminated by the dead core of the star here, a white dwarf. So this is a gas cloud uh, that's the last rem remnants of a sun-like star that's dying. Okay? And probably the best of these objects, the most interesting one to see, is the 57th object on Messier's list known as the Ring Nebula. Was discovered by the French, French astronomer Duquier in 1789, also by Messier, but a few weeks later. William Herschel in 1785 said it was among the curiosities of the heavens, a nebula that has an irregular concentric dark space in the middle. Okay? And that's exactly what it looks like in a small telescope. It looks like a little smoke ring in space. So this is, you know, in amateur sized telescopes that you could buy. Um, this is what the ring nebula looks like. Not really much color to see though, okay? But you can see the fact that it's a ring nebula. If your telescope is large enough, you can actually see the remnant star that's at the center of the ring nebula. Some other planetary nebula that are also equally interesting are M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. That's a summer object. We'll be able to see that. We would have been able to see that this evening. Uh, and then M76, the Little Dumbbell Nebula, because astronomers uh, are not really that innovative when they name objects in the nighttime sky. And lastly, an object that's now setting in the springtime sky, NGC 3242, the Ghost of Jupiter Nebula, because it's roughly the same size as the planet Jupiter in telescopes, but much, much, much dimmer. Then we have supernova remnants, which is what happens to the other types of stars. Massive stars don't end in planetary nebulas, they end in supernova explosions. And so if a star has a mass, as I said, about 10 times more than the mass of a sun, this is its fate. It ends in a titanic explosion that rips the star apart. And um, so this is what's left after one of these explosions. Uh, and uh, these objects are one of the few deep sky objects beyond our solar system that you can actually detect changes with. Um, so this object, which is M1, the Crab Nebula, Okay, and we'll talk about its history in just a minute, uh, was discovered by the English astronomer John Bevis in 1731, uh, discovered independently by Messier in 1758. Uh, it was the discovery of this object that finally tipped Messier over the edge in order to make a list of objects that he was irritated with uh, and uh, uh, so that future comet hunters would not be fooled by them. It's about 6,500 light years distant. And it's one of the few deep sky objects whose origins we know. In the year 1054, there was one of these supernovas that occurred in the Milky Way. Uh, it was recorded by Chinese astronomers, as they called it, a guest star. It was a star that appeared out of nowhere. And it was so bright that it could be visible and it was visible in the daytime sky for 23 days uh, before it began to fade away. And that object is what we now know of as the Crab Nebula. Okay. It was not recorded that anyone observed it in Europe, but interestingly enough, it was recorded here in North America. Um, so this is a depiction of what the uh, supernova would have looked like on the morning of July 5th, 1054, the first day that it was visible. And you can see it's near the crescent moon. So archaeologists have discovered in the American Southwest, the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and California, pictographs that they believe represent uh, Native Americans' view of this event back in the year 1054. This is kind of what the Crab Nebula looks like through amateur-sized telescopes. Uh, not a lot of detail visible. Um, but you can see it, and if you know its history, it becomes more interesting to think about. Some more supernova remnants that are visible. They're not a whole lot that are visible in amateur-sized telescopes. Uh, this one is known as the Veil Nebula. It has two parts, NGC 69925, which is the Network Nebula over here, 
and NGC 6960, the filamentary nebula over here. Uh, you can see this in amateur telescopes. A lot of times you may need to have a what's called a nebula filter on your telescope in order to be able to see it. Uh, it's very large though, so in most amateur telescopes you'll only be, to see, be able to see part of it at one time. And then there are glob globular clusters. So unlike open clusters that are contain a few dozen to a few hundred stars, globular clusters are groups of between a half a million to a million, and not young stars, but very ancient stars, some of the oldest stars in our universe. Many of these stars are on the order of 13 billion years old, which means they formed just after the universe formed itself. Astronomers are not quite sure what, how these globular clusters form. They're only beginning to understand that process now. Uh, but there are about 150 of these globular clusters that orbit around our galaxy, the Milky Way. Messier discovered a good number of them. Huh? Probably the best that we can see here in the northern hemisphere is the 13th object on Messier list, the Great Hercules Cluster. It was discovered by the astronomer Edmund Halley of Comet fame in the year 1714 and observed again independently by Messier in 1764. Uh, Messier's comment on this object was a nebula containing no stars. That says a lot more about the telescopes that he was using than the object itself. So this is kind of a view through what you would see uh, of the uh, Hercules cluster in an amateur sized telescope. Again, these objects tend to be very interesting to look at, I'm looking at a million stars all at once. And they tend to be uh, also some of the, the uh, most easily visible objects in small telescopes. So a few more globular clusters that are visible. Both of these are, are, will be visible in the fall, starting in September. Uh, M15 in the constellation of Pegasus, and M2 and Aquarius, both very nice globular clusters. All of these objects that we've talked about so far have one thing in common, and that's they're all objects that are inside of our galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, which is a giant, vast conglomeration of more than 200 billion stars, 100,000 light years across, and all the objects we've talked about so far are objects that are inside our Milky Way. But amazingly, amateur telescopes can pick up objects that are outside our Milky Way, including other galaxies. And they're probably definitely um, the most numerous objects that you can see in telescopes. Uh, even small telescopes can see several thousand of these galaxies. So galaxies are these huge gravitationally bound systems of stars, nuz, nebulae, dust, and dark matter. Uh, contain anywhere from a few million to hundreds of billions of stars, and they're the building blocks of matter in our universe, at least baryonic matter. Okay. Dark matter is a whole different case. One of the best external galaxies to our Milky Way that you can see in small telescopes is this object, M31, the Great Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, no one discovered it because it's bright enough that it's visible to the unaided eye. So it's been known since ancient times. If you have dark enough skies and you know where to look, you can see it with your unaided eye still today. It's the nearest large galaxy to our Milky Way. It's two and a half million light years away. And it's interesting to think about what that means. So it's taken the light from this galaxy two and a half million years to reach from that galaxy to us. So we're not seeing the galaxy as it is today. We're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. So telescopes, even small ones, are actual time machines. The farther out into space you look, the further back into time you look. So this is what a view through an amateur sized telescope would look like the Andromeda Galaxy. You can see some of the dust lanes here. Also visible in this view are two other Messier objects. This patch down here is another galaxy, M32. And this dimmer and broader patch up here is the last object on Messier's list, M110. Some other bright galaxies uh, that are visible uh, with amateur telescopes. M33 in Triangulum, uh, 
right here, uh, almost as large and fairly close to the Andromeda galaxy in the nighttime sky, not too far away from each other. In the springtime sky is M51, the Whirlpool galaxy, one of the more beautiful galaxies you can see in small telescopes. So hopefully uh, that very brief introduction has kind of whetted your appetite to, to take your telescope out and try to find some of these objects. So how do you find them and how do you observe them? So what I would recommend is first research, do some reading. So if you go into virtually any bookstore, uh, you will probably find these two magazines on the shelf, uh, Sky and Telescope and Astronomy. Uh, both are very good general introductions to astronomy, uh, both current uh, research in astronomy as well as observing the sky for yourselves. And they have one thing in common, and that's if you buy them, in the center of the magazine is a monthly sky chart, which will show you which constellations are visible for that current month, where the planets are in the nighttime sky for that month, and interesting sites that will be visible throughout the month. So as a first step, you should learn the constellations. So take one of these star charts out into your backyard and orient yourself to the direction uh, on the chart, either north, south, east, or west, and try to identify some of the star patterns for yourself so you start getting familiar with uh, the nighttime sky. We have some for sale here. Once you're familiar with some of the constellations, you can go into more detail. So you can get yourself uh, a good star map. Uh, here's an example of one uh, put out by the Orion Telescope Company. It's called Deep Map 600, uh, which is a large map of the entire nighttime sky. Uh, has more than 600 of the brightest of these deep sky objects that we've talked about and their lo locations in the night sky. I recommend if your telescope doesn't have one, you should get one because it's going to be virtually impossible to find anything without a finder scope. And there are two basic types that are in use today. You can use an optical finder, which is like a smaller telescope that sits on top of your main telescope with a lower, wider field of view. Or one of these red dot finders, uh, which throws a little illuminated red dot view up on the nighttime sky uh, to show you where you're pointed with your telescope. So what you do, and a lot of people have these on their telescope, uh, but they're not aligned with the main view of the telescope. Uh, and that means that they're not going to work very well to help you find things. Uh, so what I would recommend you do if you have a telescope with a finder scope, uh, take it out in the daytime and point your telescope at something that you can easily find in a well-lit sky, like a distant telephone pole or something like that. So the telescope is pointed at the telescope pole, unlike the stars in the nighttime sky, which move through the sky because of the rotation of the Earth, that telephone pole is not going to move, so you don't have to worry about constantly turning your telescope around. Just don't uh, point it at the sun. <laughs> yes, please do not point it at the sun, unless you have a solar filter on the telescope, but I'm not going into that in my talk. Um, so uh, point it at some distant Earth object, and then take your, tel your finder scope and make sure that it is also pointed at the same object. And uh, once they're pointed roughly at the same place, it'll be much easier to point at some bright nighttime object like the moon and fine tune so that the finder scope is pointed exactly in the same direction as your telescope is. Once you have that, it'll be much easier to find things in the nighttime sky. Now, that you've got your telescope set up so that you uh, can see where it's pointed and you're familiar with some of the uh, constellations in the nighttime sky, you can go through a procedure called star hopping, which is using known stars that you can see to find the location of objects that you can't see. Okay, So an example of that is here in the fall sky. Uh, this object here is the Andromeda galaxy, M31. We talked about that. So this shows two paths that you can find it. All of these stars should be visible from anywhere in New Jersey. This is the constellation of Pegasus. Here's the great square of Pegasus. And this is the constellation of Andromeda, these two chains of stars. So one way to find the Andromeda galaxy is to point your telescope here and then go through these two stars to Merrick and then up this way to the Andromeda galaxy. The way that I prefer is using the constellation of Cassiopeia, which kind of looks like a bent W. 
this part of the W almost looks like an arrow that points you in the direction of the Andromeda galaxy, about two times the width of this, um, this arrowhead down and it will point you right there. Once you've got your telescope pointed at that location in the nighttime sky, look through it at a low power view, you should see the Andromeda galaxy. So as you become more comfortable with finding things in the nighttime sky, you can expand uh, your search. Uh, don't be afraid to explore. There are several of these objects we talked about that are actually very easy to find in the nighttime sky, including the Andromeda Galaxy, the Ring Nebula, the Orion Nebula, and the Hercules Cluster. They're all located within star patterns that are easy to locate, okay, and easy to see in the sky. And your telescope will actually show you more than you think it will. Uh, once you get comfortable with using your telescope and finding things that you uh, are looking for in the nighttime sky, uh, you may think you can only see a few dozen of these things. You'll actually end up seeing hundreds of them. Okay, uh, And it's a fascinating activity to search them out in the nighttime sky. And then, okay, so now you have a telescope. You're familiar with using it, uh, with star hopping and uh, viewing, uh, viewing objects in the nighttime sky. How do you end up seeing more? Okay. Well, there's two ways. You can get a larger telescope. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Or you can get into astro imaging. Oh, we're not going to talk about that tonight. That's a completely different can of worms. You could talk to that gentleman walking away over there. He's a very good astro imager here if you're interested in that. But let's talk about telescope size. So uh, when I'm out here and when I'm doing public outreach with my telescope, I can always tell somebody who's new to astronomy, and I'm going to give you guys the key tonight so that you don't ask this question of anyone. So you can always tell somebody who doesn't know a lot about astronomy when they see your telescope and they walk up to you and they say, what power is your telescope? That's really the wrong question to ask. Okay. Any telescope can magnify it with any power simply by changing its eyepiece. Okay, So what is the most important qualification for a telescope? And that is aperture. Okay, Telescopes are light buckets. They're uh, devices that are designed to collect light. And you want to collect more light, you need a bigger bucket. So here's a 100 millimeter, that's a 4 inch aperture telescope. If you're looking at the Whirlpool Galaxy, uh, you may see the center of the galaxy. You may see some dimness out here. It's actually not going to look like these spiral arms here. You may see uh, the companion galaxy. This is a 250 millimeter telescope. That's a 10 inch telescope. Much brighter view. You get to see a lot more detail. Okay. So this is a view of the Hercules cluster through three different size telescopes. A six inch telescope. Yeah, you can make out that there's uh, a brighter core, there's some dimness around it. You may not see a lot of individual stars in it. You go to a 10-inch telescope, uh, you can see the bright core. You can uh, It begins to resolve thousands of stars in the galaxy. You go to a 16 or larger-inch telescope, you get a really, really nice view of these objects. And once people realize this fact, uh, you become susceptible to one of the most dread diseases that can befall an amateur astronomer, and that is aperture fever. Um, so uh, the, the end result of that is getting something like this. Um, this is called the Yard Scope. Uh, it was built by this gentleman here, Tom Clark. Uh, down in, this is down at the, uh, the Winter Star Party in Florida. It's called the Yard Scope because the mirror has an aperture of 36 inches. Um, he has his own trailer uh, to, to carry it around with. Um, and you have to stand on top of a 12-foot ladder to view through it. So it has some drawbacks. Um, but it is a spectacular view. I got a chance to actually look through this telescope uh, more than 20 years ago when I was at the Winter Star Party. And the views are spectacular. But uh, I didn't want to have a... Um, the, my choice of telescope determined my choice of vehicle. Um, and really, if you're getting a telescope this big, the logistics become a little bit intimidating. So, but you don't have to even buy a telescope. 
okay? You have people like my club, which is, if you're down in central New Jersey, uh, we're the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. Um, this is our 14-inch telescope in the John A. W. H. Simpson Observatory uh, in Washington Crossing State Park. Uh, we are open to the public now uh, after COVID. Uh, we're open on clear Friday evenings throughout the year. Uh, so come on out if you're down in that area and we'll show you the nighttime skies. And of course, we have the United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey, uh, which is uh, an organization that's dedicated to showing people the nighttime sky. Unfortunately, tonight the skies didn't cooperate, but hopefully the weather will be nicer over uh, the coming months and you'll get a chance to come out and we can show you some of these very interesting objects through some of our telescopes. And that's my talk this evening. If anyone has any uh, questions they'd like to ask, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. And hopefully the skies will clear and you'll get a chance to view some of these objects for yourselves. Thank you. All right. Before we take questions, I'm going to give this mic to him and I'll take the mobile mic, so. All right. And the reason I did this is because we are streaming this live and I thank everyone for also tuning in who has uh, been on our YouTube and whatnot. Um, and they have a couple questions as well as you guys. So in the effort of fairness, when I'll, I'll call out their questions, but uh, when, when you wanna ask a question, I will bring the mic to you so you can speak into the mic and they can actually also hear the question that you guys have. Um, well, the, we do have a Q&A session now, uh, usually, and while I'm waiting for uh, the last minute call for questions in the online chat uh, to come through, I am going to go over a couple things again. Like I said, if you do need to use the restroom, we do have the porta potty to my right behind you, your left. We also have the gift shop, which uh, again, the donate, we are a nonprofit, so any donation, you okay there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any donations uh, do get put towards uh, keeping our lights on, uh, improvements and upkeep of the facility and whatnot. And uh, when you leave here, use your headlights. Running over people is not fun. Getting run over is not fun. Don't ask me how I know. Um, so usually we would, like he said, have the observatories open and each shed over to my left houses its own telescope um, unfortunately it is very very damp and unpleasant out and I'm actually standing in a ground-based cloud also known as fog a different kind of planetary nebula mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately we don't have any of the observatories open uh, we just don't have telescopes here that uh, are good for public viewing through clouds. Uh, of course, there are radio telescopes and whatnot that can do have that uh, capability, but again, they're, they're slightly boring to look at. So um, with that, uh, one of the first questions I had was, what are the stars on the door to the right? So everyone who has uh, donated or spent $20 in the gift shop um, has gotten a star on our door. Uh, a couple people uh, who have donated through online have also, I have put their name on a star. I might get better stars later. We'll see. Um, so I wanted to take care of that question first. So. Are there any questions from our in-person audience? And like I said, I will bring the mic to you so our online audience can hear. Bueller? Anyone? I just want to say I appreciate your tip so much. Thank you. I really appreciate this very much. Thank you. Enjoy getting out with your telescope and trying some of them out. We're waiting for it to be delivered. Oh, uh, there is another question that actually is uh, related to having a new scope. So they got an, a telescope and it has a small assortment of eyepieces. Mm -hmm. Now each one is obviously a different magnification. What one do you put in the scope to find the objects? 
So if you take a look at the eyepieces on your telescope, you'll see each of them will have a numbering on them uh, in terms of the focal length of the eyepiece. So 10 millimeters, 15 millimeters, 25 millimeters, and so on. So in order to determine, determine the magnification of your telescope, you take the focal length of your telescope and divide it by the focal length of your eyepiece. And if you do that math, it turns out that the eyepiece with the longest focal length will give you the widest, lowest power view. So you want to take your eyepiece that has the highest number uh, focal length and use that. That'll give you the lowest power view. That's what you use to find objects with. And then once you've found them, you can change out the eyepiece and increase the power by using other eyepieces. OK, so basically, if you have a choice of three eyepieces, a 9, a 16, and a 32, mm -hmm. um, you would choose the 32 to get onto the object and then work your way down to a larger magnification. And you might have to work your way back up to see, um, yep. to get the image you're looking for. Oh, was there another question from? Oh, all right, let me bring you the mic. So uh, if you pick this up as a hobby and you've been doing it for 40 years, you said, mm -hmm. what 50. are those milestones that an amateur hits starting with, like you said, moon and then solar system and then how far does it go? Like, uh, that's I haven't reached the end yet. <laughs> um, so I, I started out, I was um, uh, one of those children who grew up fascinated by the, the Apollo moon landing program back in the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, started doing amateur astronomy uh, with a very small storeboard telescope back then. Um, I have increased the sizes of my telescope since then. Um, the largest telescope I ever owned was a 15-inch telescope. Um, I currently have five telescopes. Um, don't tell my wife that. Um, she collects dogs, I collect telescopes. She has now three dogs, so if I tell her I have five telescopes, there are two more dogs in my future. Um, dun, dun, I dun. also have built a, uh, an observatory in my backyard, um, which is an entire another project. But now I have a, a, a five-inch refractor telescope sitting in my backyard that I can use whenever I want, whenever the skies are clear. And I'm, I do uh, astro imaging. Uh, uh, mainly um, what's called electronically assisted or video astronomy, uh, but I'm also starting to get into um, long uh, exposure astrophotography. And the nice thing about um, uh, amateur astronomy as a hobby is um, there's no upper limit <laughs> to the, the price of equipment that you can buy. Uh, you can just keep dumping more and more money into this hobby if you have the money uh, to get better and better equipment. And that's what I do. Um, that's how I, I spend all my free cash, uh, is buying telescopes and using them. And uh, something that I've enjoyed doing now for 50 years. Um, in terms of actually uh, uh, using the telescope, um, the quality of equipment that people can buy these days means that amateurs can actually do real science um, with their telescopes. Uh, whether it's observing variable stars, um, tracking supernovas and galaxies. Um, the thing about professional astronomers is that there's only, uh, in the whole world, a few thousand professional astronomers. And in terms of large telescopes, there's only a few dozen really large telescopes. So all of those astronomers are competing for time on very few number of telescopes, which means that of the trillions and trillions of objects in the universe, uh, very few of them actually get observed by professional astronomers, and the rest of them are all ours. We can observe them ourselves and uh, just for enjoyment or to actually do science. All right. Um, I do actually have another question, uh, and this one was from, I'm going to butcher her last name, unfortunately, Jody Keegan, and I'm going to greatly apologize if I have butchered your name. Uh, and she asked, can you please comment on the dimming of Betelgeuse in Orion? And has there been a determination of the cause? Um, so Betelgeuse is um, actually a variable star. Astronomers have known that for many years now. Um, they were a little surprised uh, over the last uh, year or two because it dimmed much more 
than it has in the past. And there was a lot of speculation about whether this meant that eventually Betelgeuse was on the verge of exploding as a supernova. Um, but it turns out that nothing that quite dramatic is going to happen. Eventually, that will happen to Betelgeuse sometime in the future, uh, whether it happens next year, 100 years from now, 10,000 years from now, no one knows. Uh, but the dimming over the last couple of years, astronomers believed was uh, just a little bit you know, more intense of its normal dimming uh, due to an accumulation of uh, carbon dust in its atmosphere uh, that made uh, its normal dimming a little bit dimmer than usual. So it needs to quit smoking is what I'm hearing. Uh, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> All right. Was there another question from our live audience? I have a question. All right. Let me just bring you the mic. Uh, the online audience can't hear you without it. No, you don't. <laughs> Hi, very good talk, by the way. Thank you. Uh, getting back to astronomical seeing, mm -hmm. when is the best time for seeing in these parts of New Jersey? Is there any particular season that's better than any other? Um, anecdotally, I would say the fall. Yeah. Um, there have been, I, you know, I've, I've lived in New Jersey now for 36 years. Uh, I can count uh, the number of nights that have had superb seeing on the fingers of one hand, and I've had fingers left over. Um, but one of the nights that it was in October, uh, November, I was actually up here. Um, it was the night in 1999 where we had the Leonid meteor storm. I'm not sure if you remember that. I was up here to view that. And uh, I got up here early in the evening and was out in uh, one of the observatories here. And that night was unbelievably steady and clear. I got views of the planets that night that I have never seen again in 30 years. Uh, so try the fall. Uh, usually uh, after the storms of summer, uh, the atmosphere tends to flatten out a little bit. Um, if you really want good seeing for, for planets, places like Florida, uh, are the best places because they don't have a lot of mountains. It's flat, so the, the air coming off the ocean just kind of goes over the land and doesn't get disturbed all that much. A lot of people who do planetary imaging tend to be in Florida for that reason. Okay. I would think like out west they'd be better, better seen. Well, the problem is you got those mountains, uh -huh. and then the air is coming across the plane. It hits those mountains, and then the scene goes okay. away. All uh, right. Any more questions? All right, so while I'm giving uh, online chat just a, a minute or so to uh, get any last minute questions in, I wanna thank everyone for coming out here. Uh, we are United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey, uh, which means we are an umbrella organization for other clubs uh, in New Jersey. And actually we have one in New York State and also PA. Uh, we do, suggests that if you are interested in astronomy, getting into being an amateur astronomer, you check out your local clubs. Um, really, they're going to be some of your best resources for what you can want to do. Um, they're going to be able to give you uh, tips for your local area, um, and plus they're local and convenient to you. Um, our James, who... Uh, Bill pointed out earlier is one of our amateur astronomers and he went out to Cherry Springs. Fortunately, I believe that's about six hours away from here. Yeah. Um, and not everyone has the time nor desire to drive six hours to go camp out in the middle of the field. Uh, so again, your local club is going to be one of your best uh, bets for what you can see in your local area and uh, for figuring out hey, you know, I we have this light pollution problem, but I know this spot is really good for catching these planets or items, as I'm dancing around with chat and accidentally typing. Um, on that note, uh, you can check us, our club out. Uh, we are open to the public on Saturdays from April through October, and that's every Saturday. Uh, we are currently doing all our talks outdoors, uh, which is slightly less than ideal when you get surprise fog and whatnot, but we've made the best of it when we can. If you can't make it here, you can check us out on our YouTube. And like I said, all our past um, 
talks from the past year since COVID actually start, we were able to open up during COVID, have been brought saved on that online format. So with that, it doesn't look like there's any more questions, so I can stop dancing around with that. Um, I want to thank you, Bill, for a great talk. Thank you. I want to not stand directly under the leaky gutter. <laughs> and uh, thank you guys for coming out, and have a good night. Thank you.